All right, welcome everyone uh, to the class today, the Transdisciplinary Seminar. Um, we are delighted to have such a, a large group that we actually have to bring in more chairs. And we welcome everyone, of course, online as well um, to the talk today uh, by Dr. Jessica Blight. And we're delighted that she's agreed. We did have a, a separate speaker lined up, but of course, um, yep, we GNWT is having their own challenges and, and they will come to visit just at a later time in the term. Um, this kind of works really well for us as co-instructors of the course because we're suggesting maybe a slightly revised format for the question and answer sessions after class based on um, conversations that Jessica and I have had as well as conversations we have with the class in the first seminar. Which is great. So um, we'll save that a little bit for later. Um, for the moment, we'll get right to our guest speaker today. Um, Jessica is an associate professor in the Environmental Sustainability Research Center at Brock, as many of you may know. You may or may not know that she grew up in Newfoundland. Incredibly jealous of that. Um, and she did so during the collapse of the North Atlantic cod um, stocks. So that's really inspired some of the work that she's now involved in. Jessica's trained as a human geographer. She has a PhD in geography from UVic. She has a Master of Arts in Geography from York University and a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology from uh, Memorial University. She, in her research, she explores how various groups of people experience social ecological change and what explains their differential capacities to respond. And you may well know she's working around three main research themes in transformations to sustainability, um, equitable ocean governance, and that's probably the theme that we're landing on today for the most part, and then climate change adaptation. Um, you may have followed Jessica's work. She's a well-known, world-renowned scholar, in my humble opinion, who's been um, awarded for her work here locally, recognized for her research here, um, and as an early career scholar. And of course, she's uh, been recognized uh, globally. A lot of her um, work has been reported on uh, different social media platforms and the news, etc. And there's demands for her, of course, uh, to partake in lots of interviews um, often because her work is really timely and, um, and really important in terms of uh, the climate change crisis we face today and also uh, crises around the um, fisheries and oceans. So um, without further delay, I'll invite Jessica to give her talk on Blue Justice Lessons from Grassroots Resistance Movements. And that presentation is large, largely based on a paper that um, you were asked to pre-read for this class today. So thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much for the wonderful uh, introduction. And hi, everybody. Lovely to see you. Happy Tuesday. Um, it's such an honor for me to do um, the first transistor seminar of the year and to speak to you about this uh, sort of new strand of my research that's emerged in the last five years or so that I really just love and feel very deeply about, so it's a privilege uh, to be here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the story today sort of begins in 1982 in Warren County in North Carolina in the United States. Uh, the state decided they had this uh, pile of contaminated soil, contaminated with PCBs, which is a cancer-causing toxin, and they needed to put it somewhere. And they decided that they were going to put it in the county with the highest percentage of people uh, with African American heritage in the whole county. And that had been happening all over the world. But on that day, uh, the county, uh, members of the county decided to protest against it. And that protest on that day in 1982 sparked a uh, global movement. And so if we jump ahead uh, to 32 years later, three decades later, we see a similar kind of thing happening in Australia. So in Australia, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, the port of Newcastle is where Australia ships most of its coal out via these large super tankers, mostly up to other countries, including China. And a bunch of people from the Pacific Island nations across the 
Pacific, uh, decided to protest against that export of coal. And they did so in small traditional canoes. And you can see the scale at which uh, these protests were happening, little hand paddled canoes against these massive super tankers. And so I highlight these as sort of examples of what this um, blue justice concept is all about. It's really sort of a David and Goliath story about these small groups of people that are usually marginalized, they're usually excluded from decision making, they are almost always oppressed by these historic and structural um, issues that we'll dive into. But rather than just being victims of that, they are actively fighting against it. They're actively going up against these large, wealthy, powerful, sometimes governments, sometimes corporations. And so that struggle between sort of an underdog in these marginalized groups and these big, powerful players is what the justice is all about. However, it's not just about the little guys fighting the big guys. Blue Justice is also a story about these communities saying, no, we reject this narrative of victim. And instead, they're reframing the narrative. And they are saying, we are actually sources of knowledge, sources of these deep embedded ecological traditions. And so they're, they're changing that narrative. And this is such a wonderful example where the, these are members of the Pacific Island Warriors, who are a group of um, Pacific Islanders protesting against climate injustices. And they're saying, we're not drowning. Stop saying, oh, we're going underwater from sea level rise, but we're actively fighting. And so the blue active resistance from uh, these local communities. So my talk today is going to uh, unfold across three parts. The first part is a, history, a history of blue justice. Nori, I'm not going to quote you correctly, but Nori's comprehensive exams was framed under knowing the past to understand the future, something like that. I've misquoted her. But I think it's so important for us to know the roots of these active concepts, of these social movements, in order to then understand what we are seeing currently and how we can jump in and contribute. So we'll start there. Then we'll move into cases of blue injustices, because I think it's really important that we not only understand how this is playing out, but look at sort of the root drivers of these injustices. And then third, we're going to um, come back to these resistance movements and look at what we can learn from uh, resistance movements. So those are the three parts. So to begin talking about blue justice, we have to ask ourselves the question of what is justice? And justice is one of those words that we all know, and it's very intuitive, and we all draw on it all the time, but it's also very nebulous and hard to define. And it's also one of the concepts that has been debated for millennia in human societies. You know, Greek philosophers debated about what is justice, and the notion changes, and it changes over time, but it also changes based on who is defining it. And so there are lots of different schools of thought on what justice is, and I won't go into those today. Um, but one of the influential thinkers in the space of sort of philosophy and moral philosophy around politics of justice is John Rawls. And so John Rawls argues that if there are any injustices in society, they have to be uh, played out in a way that benefits those who are marginalized. So for John Rawls, equity, uh, justice is not always about everyone having the same thing, but rather it's looking at where there are discrepancies in a society. And that uh, definition is disagreed with by many, but is also adopted by many. And it uh, is kind of the foundation of this very famous uh, infographic, which was commissioned by the Interaction Institute for Social Change in 19, uh, sorry, 2016. And it's everywhere. Uh, if you work in this space, you've seen it a million times across a million versions. But I think it's important just to speak to the language around this, because justice scholars lose their minds about equity versus equality and what that is. And it really is subscribing back to that John Rawls theory on uh, what justice means. It's essentially what's fair. And so John Rawls and theorists in that school of thought, myself included, and the work that we do, argue that we're not all starting at the same place, but rather we're starting from very uneven places. And those are not because someone didn't work hard, that's the merit-based approach on justice, but rather it's because there are these historical legacies of colonialism and racism and wealth accumulation that has made the um, playing field very uneven. So if we talk about equality, it means everybody receives the same thing. 
and that's the second picture here. But if we subscribe to the idea that we all start in very different places, then equality isn't really going to right those uh, historic imbalances or injustices. So rather, there's been a focus on equity, which is that those who have been historically marginalized need to receive sort of different supports or different opportunities than those who have traditionally been um, benefiting and accumulating in the society. And then there's another school of thought that says if we want to go even beyond uh, equity, we should be arguing for notions of justice. And notions of justice are rather than giving different opportunities and access, it's trying to remove systemic barriers in the, that, that are there in the first place. So this graphic has sort of grown over time, but it's just a bit of an a introduction to the language and kind of the different schools of thought around what justice and equity can look like um, for different communities. So if justice is about what's fair and who has been traditionally oppressed and marginalized and who has benefited from that, um, then we can move into the idea of environmental justice. So before we get the blue justice, I want to talk about two concepts that have preceded it and that really inform the way we think about it. So as we talked about on the first slide, in Warren County in 1982, the community said, no, we do not want your toxic cancer-causing dirt dumped here, and it's not an accident that you're dumping it here in this community that is very poor and that is traditionally African American, but rather, this happens all the time. And so the Warren County protests are largely credited for sparking the environmental justice movement, where they united the civil rights movement that was advocating for uh, race inequality and those types of issues, fair labor, fair living environments with the environmental movement, which until that time had been largely very white dominated and largely not engaged with issues of systemic racism and inequality, but it was very much focused on like pristine nature, if you will. So this was a really exciting and important uh, time because it sparked this movement. Uh, interestingly, I think the protest itself didn't prevent the dumping of soil there. They still dumped it anyway, but it did ignite this global movement that has become this environmental justice movement. Um, Dr. Robert Bullard is largely credited as, as being the father of the movement, and he worked very closely alongside these communities, and he still does to this day, on um, advancing understandings of environmental justice. And in a nutshell, environmental justice argues that um, environmental harms, whether that be toxic pollution, uh, big industry, uh, those types of things, are almost always located in marginalized communities. Uh, they're very closely related to your race, your economic uh, status, and, and other things like ethnic, ethnicity. Um, and so this is just like a very quick uh, background of where this idea came from. So following the protests in Warren County, a report was commissioned that did a nationwide study in the U.S. And they found that your postal code and your race were very closely tied together and very closely tied to whether or not you were exposed to environmental harms. This is a ridiculously quick history, but just to say, um, the protest sparked it. It became a nationwide study uh, and, and sort of concept in the US, but now, over the last 30 years, it has really become a global movement, and it has become a global field of study, as well as a sort of movement alongside. And this is just to highlight one of the incredible resources we have at our disposal these days. This is called the Environmental Justice Atlas, and it marks, um, examples of injustices that are happening in communities all over the world. So if your research is based in a place that you're interested in, or maybe your family is based in a place, you can look it up here and you can zoom in. And they have all these different types and cases as one of the ways that the movement and the field of research is trying to uncover um, issues of these inequitable exposures of marginalized communities to environmental harms. So that's a really quick overview of where environmental justice sort of came from, but I want to just share a three-minute video because I think the concept is so critical. It's often on the peripheries of environmental sustainability and like the mainstream environmental movement. So I'd like to watch this and then we'll go um, to the next concept, which is climate justice. Okay, so this is, here are all the people living people of all different colors, ages, wealths, and incomes. Except they don't all live together in the same place. 
They're separated into different parts of the city by what color they are, what language they speak, and how much money they have. And those different parts of the city look quite different. The parts that are wider and wealthier tend to have green spaces, grocery stores with nutritious organic food, and of course somebody to buy it, and are often far away from pollution and many freeways. The parts that are poorer and more diverse tend to have industrial sites, heavy-duty diesel-polluted ports and highways, and hazardous waste. All things that the city relies on to run properly, but that heavily pollute the air and water. And even if they have those grocery stores with nutritious organic food, most residents there couldn't afford it anyway. How did this happen? Well, this segregation can be traced back to race-based zoning and housing policies, but it wasn't always as deliberate as plain old racism. Some separations can simply be traced to poor land use planning. And, as a result, these residents of the same city live very different lives. Santa City realizes it has an emissions problem. It comes up with a plan to reduce air pollution, or plant more trees to suck up the carbon, or start a cap and trade program. But those trees get planted in the neighborhoods that are already green, and the factories that are spewing toxins into the air just buy more carbon offsets and keep spewing their toxins. The benefits of these programs are enjoyed by the communities that are already doing just fine. And the communities that were hurting most from all that air pollution, well, they're still hurting. This isn't just an imaginary city. This is the story of real cities all across the U.S. where people might live in the very same area code, but their race, ethnicity, or wealth and income bracket causes them to experience wildly different quality of air, water, and life. In fact, it can even mean that they also experience different threats. That's how serious this stuff is. This kind of inequity expands far beyond cities, too. Rural areas are full of commercially valuable resources like oil and coal, and they're also home to indigenous and low-income communities. But when those resources are extracted, those communities don't see any of the money, and they end up with all the air and water contamination that's left over from the extraction. And we even see this injustice on a global level, like in small island nations that are forced to directly confront the consequences of rising sea levels, but haven't played any significant role in the industries that are causing climate change. These peoples are sometimes forced to flee their homes because their land is literally going underwater. But the very states that did play a hand in creating climate change don't have migration policies to accommodate them. So when we talk about environmental justice, we're talking about how we can try to break down and reimagine a system that's built up on these inequities. A system where those who are already disadvantaged because of their race and economic status are made poor because they're unable to profit from the resources that the world depends on and are made sick or worse by the environmental contamination that comes with extracting those resources. Social inequities are intimately tied to the environment. That's why social justice is an environmental issue, too. Okay, so that's a very quick overview, but I think the concepts are really foundational for our thinking about blue justice, so thank you for um, watching that. And so you notice towards the end of the video, they started talking about inequalities in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and then who is experiencing the impacts of climate change. And that is now known as the climate justice movement. So if you think of uh, environmental justice as the big umbrella, climate justice is a type of environmental justice. And it is about 20 years old in terms of the concept. Um, it was originally uh, proposed at the Climate Justice Summit in uh, 2001 at the sixth COP, we're now on to COP 27, I think, you know, so 20 years ago, um, the idea that those who produce the most greenhouse gas emissions, like Canada, for example, often are the uh, most prepared to adapt to the impacts of climate change, whereas countries, for example, in the Pacific Islands that are put, uh, emitting, you know, decimal points of the global greenhouse gas emissions are often the ones who are really bearing um, the most of the impacts currently. And that inequality uh, is, is really sort of the concept of climate justice. And if it's familiar to you, that's great, because I think the movement has been quite vocal and, and in arguing about these inequalities and actually making some policy changes. Um, just to point out that a lot of people credit Hurricane Katrina as sort of the beginning of the awakening towards climate justice in the US and then globally. Uh, and Hurricane Katrina, you know, famously uh, really 
didn't affect wealthy white populations and really smashed poor and predominantly black communities in New Orleans. And this is a picture of people who were stranded, um, and that was one of, it, it, it's credited as being sort of in, in liaison, obviously, with the things that were happening at the cops, but sort of the birth of the climate justice movement. Thank you, Yoko. Come on in. I'm sorry, we're running short on chairs, so it's so lovely to see you. Um, so climate justice as a type of environmental justice and as a movement that's now about 20 years old and just something that I think is quite personally exciting is it's a really growing and vibrant movement. Uh, it's now, there's little pockets of climate justice on most university campuses, but the University of British Columbia just started this Climate Justice Institute in the last couple of years, and it's got really incredible people. Naomi Klein is a professor there. And so just to say this movement is very uh, alive and well and growing, uh, which to me is quite exciting. So that was a mini history of environmental justice, climate justice, and then under that big umbrella, there's this new term uh, which was coined in 2018. So only five years old, which is a baby by academic concept standards, um, is this term uh, blue justice. The, the words itself were coined by Maniba Isaacs, who is this wonderful South African academic who works with coastal communities. She put that term together and said it at the World um, Small Scale Fisheries Forum uh, in 2018. And for her, she was really saying that blue justice is about protecting the rights of small scale fishers, particularly those rights that are being undermined by uh, development under the banner of the blue economy. So that's a lot of jargon, but there's this new idea of blue economy, which in a nutshell says our uh, economies on land are lagging, and we need constant growth if we're going to stay in this capitalist paradigm, so let's move to the ocean and start making more money off of the ocean. And so there's huge investments going on in oceans and coastal spaces right now. A lot of it looks like big industrial expansion, and a lot of local rights are being eroded uh, in the name of blue economy. So, Maniba coined the term five years ago, uh, and it's been picked up by several groups globally. One of the groups that has really picked up and sort of advanced the, the field is the group called Too Big to Ignore, which is based out of St. John's, Newfoundland, and led by Dr. Ratna Chiyapagdi uh, and Dr. Stan Yentoff. But they have been really um, active in the space of taking that term and then running with it and documenting cases of blue injustices uh, around the world. But their focus has very much been on small-scale fisheries. And so that's when my group comes into this story. So we got a grant, and we are working on these issues of equity and justice. And we wanted to understand what does this term mean uh, in, the, in the literature right now? What could it mean going forward? And so that's where our work comes in. So we build on the wonderful work of Dr. Isaacs and Dr. Chen Pegby, uh, et cetera. But we end up arguing that blue justice is bigger than just small scale fishers' rights and just being threatened by the blue economy. But rather, blue justice refers to the recognition, meaningful involvement, and fair treatment of all coastal peoples um, with respect to how ocean and coastal resources are accessed, used, managed, and enjoyed. That's a big, long definition, but we'll get into some examples of why we think that should be brought in out, uh, and why we argue that in this paper and body of work. And we also argue that blue justice, very much like the environmental justice literature, argues that uh, it also recognizes the inherent right of people to a healthy environment, and that that uh, exposure to these environmental harms is uh, an injustice. So that's the end of the mini history of uh, where the sort of concept came from and where the, the roots of this thinking is. So now we're moving into some cases of blue injustices. And the reason we argue, and it's not just us people in the field, that we need to understand these is not just to collect cases, which is important in and of itself, but to also look at these root drivers, because often it's a sort of similar trend that we see. And understanding the root drivers gives us potential entry points to try and fight against these. So for us, um, blue justice, sorry, blue injustice is defined as the inequitable exposure of oppressed or marginalized people to coastal and marine harms, as well as their exclusion from decision making. 
Uh, and so we give a couple different examples of how this plays out. We talk about three in this paper, but there are many uh, that, that go beyond this. But just to give you some examples to make you sort of really feel what this is like. Um, this ship that we're looking at is uh, notorious. It's called the Cayenne Sea. Uh, and it was um, famously left the port in Philadelphia in the States. And it was carrying all of this garbage that was burning. And the US was like, this is too toxic for us. Let's get it out of here. And so the ship set sail. And over a course of two years, it went to 10 different countries to say, will you take our garbage? And everyone said, no, we don't want your toxic garbage that makes our people sick, makes our environments polluted, gives us cancer. And eventually they ended up in Haiti. They told the Haitian authorities that it was not toxic, and they dumped 4,000 tons, which was only part of what they were holding. And the Haitian government somehow must have been tipped off, but they found out that it was toxic. And so before they were able to go and charge these guys and send it back to the U.S., the ship fled, and apparently no one knows, but they said they dumped it at sea somewhere. So that's just an example of the kind of um, exposure of poor and marginalized places to these kinds of environmental hazards. At the time of this story, Haiti was the poorest country in the Northern Hemisphere, and the U.S. was the richest country. And those power dynamics play out almost every time in all of these cases. And we have a really bad history in the global north of exporting our toxins. And when they're shipped by sea, they often end up in coastal communities. Um, you know, Canada was... Uh, shamefully called out a couple of years ago by the government of the Philippines for having shipped much a lot of our toxic waste, including e-waste, uh, in, into the Philippines. And they said, okay, come get your toxic garbage back. But that pattern um, persists. And so that's just one example and kind of a famous one that's like very striking and, and memorable. But this happens all over the planet in coastal communities. Um, in the paper, we talk about this uh, term called sacrifice zone. And a sacrifice zone is essentially a place that is knowingly exposed to harmful toxins and chemicals in the name of economic growth. And so we highlight a community in Chile, which is the site of all these heavily polluting industries. Cancer rates and hospitalizations and deaths are way above the average in that community, but it's a decision that's been actively made. And it's almost always because the community doesn't have enough power to fight back against that. They are excluded from the decisions. They just get told, now you're going to have another industry here. Uh, so we see it in those kinds of ways. We also see it in um, seafood and accumulation of toxins in seafood. So we give some examples in the paper of communities in the north in Canada that have really high levels of toxins because their, uh, see their diet is so heavy in seafoods that have these toxins accumulated. And that's another way that some of this is playing out in coastal communities. So that's one uh, type of blue injustice. The second that we talk about, which is probably the most well known to all of us, is resource extraction. And this is both uh, non-renewable and renewable resource extraction. So famously, you know, photogenically, uh, the way that we ship 90% of the goods and services that we uh, you know, all buy these days is via the ocean. Um, this was a really awful, damaging, and famous oil spill that happened a couple of years ago in the small island state of Mauritius. Um, a colleague on the paper was actually there at Ground Zero when this happened. And it's not just that the environment is damaged, which is awful and unjust in the first place, but there's all these layers of injustices. So Mauritius doesn't have an oil and gas industry, so they're not prepared to deal with this kind of spill. They haven't had a spill in the past, so they don't have the equipment or the know-how. So that is another layer of injustice. And then it goes even deeper. So our colleague, Gashina um, Nagy, who is on the paper, she interviewed communities afterwards, and the government handed out cash donations, donations cash income to fishers that had lost their ability to fish after the oil spill, but they didn't give it to the women fishers in the community. And we know now that women fish almost always in these fishing communities, but it's often in a more informal way. And so the kind of injustices that happen through these are always layered and they're always intersectional, which means they play out along lines of identity of oppression that are often based on more than just your income, more than just your ethnicity, more than just your gender, but these interacting um, lines of oppression. So that's the injustices um, from a non-renewable uh, extraction. But just to say this also plays out in the fishing sector and in our renewable resources. So um, 
Ian Urbina is this wonderful uh, journalist who wrote a book called Outlaw Ocean, and he's been one of the really vocal advocates of slavery at sea, which you might have heard about. But essentially, uh, in our commercial uh, fishing sector, a lot of um, people are flown to the coast that may have never been to the coast before. And then the employer says, oh, we're going to give you this really high paying job. They always target very poor people. So somebody who's very poor, they say, come to the coast, we're going to put you out on this fishing vessel, and then you go home with all this money for your family. But what happens is they charge them for the flight, and the debt uh, accumulates interest. And so they track them by this debt, which they weren't upfront about in the first place. And then they often go out on ships, which are not humongous, like, comfortable ships. These are places that are just horrific in terms of human rights abuses, and they keep them out at sea for months and sometimes years at a time. And so that's another type of injustice that is playing out. And the worst part, okay, this is not the worst part, that's a very privileged thing to say. We are connected to this because a lot of these slavery at sea um, fishing boats are targeting tuna, which end up in our grocery stores and in our cans, you know, where we often don't question where that comes from. But that's another way that injustices at sea are playing out. There are many other examples, but I will move on because it's too much. So a third type of injustice that we talk about in this paper um, is something called ocean grabbing. And so ocean grabbing describes these large scale acquisitions of coastal environments through buying or leasing uh, land often by transnational companies or sometimes by governments. Uh, you know, it's often the same sort of powerful players uh, that exclude local communities from accessing. And so this is a picture from uh, where I did my PhD research in coastal Mozambique. And inside this dotted line is an industrial uh, scale shrimp farm. And so the farm was French owned and the government of Mozambique made a deal with the French company. So the government received uh, you know, an economic benefit from this. The French company came in, they put up fences all around here and they actually had armed guards outside of the um, shrimp <coughs> farm. And local people were just you know, physically removed from that place. And they had lived there before and they had made livelihood uh, activities here before. And so they were kicked out. And again, this is one of those things that does connect to our daily lives as well. So the farm them itself was organic. And so if we are trying to be a responsible consumer, we might think, oh, I'm going to get organic tiger brown. This is like a good product for me to buy. But we don't recognize there's often these backstories uh, about how those things are produced. And in this case, um, the shrimp was largely flown to France to high-end markets in Paris for these like wealthy people that probably thought, oh, I'm buying a good product because this is produced organically. But it often results in the displacement of local people, which is another type of injustice. And just to say, this, this idea of ocean grabbing is playing out in uh, the name of a lot of sustainability initiatives. So a lot of carbon offset programs might put a fence around a mangrove forest and say, now this is a carbon sink. Locals get out of here. That's a form of injustices. And you know, we've talked about it in class, but we're concerned about the new 30 by 30 global biodiversity framework, which says between now and 2030, which is seven short years, we're going to enclose 30% of our ocean spaces in protected areas, which can be great and they can be co managed or managed by communities. But sometimes they've had a history as well of drawing an area, a circle around, and saying, locals, you're not allowed in this space anymore. So that can perpetuate uh, injustices. OK. <clears throat> so to conclude the depressing part of the talk, um, we argue that blue justice needs to be broadened out to include all these other types of individuals and groups in coastal areas that are being exposed to injustices and harms in the coastal space. Um, we argue that intersecting forms of oppression render certain groups vulnerable, and these groups are almost always the same, uh, you know, groups that are not allowed to decide what happens in coastal spaces, uh, groups that are often on the front lines in terms of dependence on a healthy marine environment, and often in terms of their stewardship um, potential. Uh, this is an infographic from another paper that we wrote this year 
um, which sort of tries to summarize the fact that a lot of these things are also converging. They often experience multiple uh, types of injustices at the same time, like the sacrifice zones. They are often socially differentiated. So if you're a woman, uh, you're economically marginalized, you're probably going to experience it differently than other groups. And they're geographically distributed along familiar lines, which are often global north, uh, extracting resources or dumping toxins, and then uh, the global south often being on the front lines of these um, of, of these types of um, injustices. So I tried to make the talk a bit of a good news sandwich because I know it's kind of depressing. And so we started with resistance movements. We talked through injustices, and now we're going back to resistance movements, which is a very exciting uh, part of this this work, I believe. So from pole to pole, coastal communities have long mobilized to defend their rights, to oppose harmful and extractive projects, and to reimagine their collective futures. You know, we saw that uh, playing out in Australia. We, it's been going on for hundreds, thousands of years. However, with few exceptions, these efforts have not been really emphasized in the Blue Justice Scholarship or in the Marine and Coastal Scholarship um, full stop. And so one of the things that we are trying to advocate for is that we actually need to play a role uh, alongside these communities in both studying them, understanding them, supporting them. And so that is an exciting part of how we're proposing we can, uh, you know, maybe add some uh, complexity to the idea of Blue Justice. So I'll talk you to, through um, three types of resistance that have been incredibly successful and should be inspiring to us. Um, we define blue resistance as processes of collective action, so that's communities generally working together, that are sustained across time and space, that reflect grievances around perceived injustices, and that constitute a pursuit of alternative futures. And so that bit to me is the really exciting and important part that is not really well enough emphasized is the groups aren't saying stop, we don't want to be. They're saying, hey, we've got better ideas, we've got better ways, we have different pathways to sustainability. Uh, and so there's so much to be learned from these movements um, that they're not, yeah, they're not victims. They're not just saying stop, but rather they're, they're really innovators. So protests might be the most visible and well-known form of resistance against these kind of injustices. Um, and there's been really you know, powerful and effective uh, ways to do this. This is a picture of the foreign minister of the country, Pacific country, um, Tuvalu. And he famously spoke to the UN's COP climate conference, standing in the ocean, talking about how their country is on the front lines of sea level rise and making a really sort of active protest against um, these climate injustices. The Pacific Islanders, I argue, have been very effective in uh, mainstreaming ideas around climate injustice. And you know, there's, there's changing conversations at COP and at these global conventions, um, I would say, attributable to these kinds of movements. We also know that coastal indigenous nations have been incredibly effective at um, mobilizing and protesting against environmental injustices, particularly around big oil. So on the coast, the British Columbian coast of Canada, for example, um, the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline was very much um, uh, protested against and resisted by many First Nations communities on the West Coast over a number of years. And that pipeline was eventually canceled. And the expansion was not approved. And it was largely because the government agreed that the consultation process with the Indigenous nations had not been adequate. So that's an example of the fact that these can be um, very effective at pushing back. A second type of resistance that might not be as visible, but is equally arguably more powerful, is an institutional approach. So that's sort of fighting back through policy and through um, legal frameworks. And that has been an incredibly powerful way for um, coastal communities to fight back. So one of the examples that we give in the paper, which I love, is the coastal nation of Palau. Um, all of a sudden had all of this interest in their sea cucumber um, fisheries. Sea cucumbers are like these blobs that live on the bottom of the ocean, so they're very easy to catch because they don't go anywhere, you just pick them up. They're also incredibly high value in um, foreign markets. Uh, they're, you know, prized for making soups, and they have all these, like, uh, ideas around virility and stuff like that. So anyway, a, a single cucumber can be thousands and thousands of dollars. 
So this huge sort of illegal market for sea cucumber burst onto the scene in Palau, and they recognized that their resources were being really depleted. And so the customary chiefs got together and put a customary ban, and they said, hey, Palauians, let's not harvest these and sell them for money. We want to protect this space. And so all of the communities agreed to the customary ban, and then the national government recognized what was going on at the community scale, and they said, hey, this is actually really damaging for our whole nation. So then they put a national uh, legal ban as well. And so that was sort of an institutional channel that the communities followed that was very effective. And, and since that happens, there's been no uh, illegal fishing of the sea cucumber. Um, I put up the small scale fisheries guidelines because it's one of our favorite new um, pieces of legislation that recognizes the rights of small scale fishers. And so most nations globally, you know, 200 plus have signed on to this. And it now gives us some ammunition to say, hey, you've signed on to this thing which recognizes the access rights of small scale fishers, that kind of thing. And just to say, this is coming. Um, there's this uh, organization called the Tenure Facility which is trying to say we recognize the value of indigenous and locally managed lands, and we're trying to uh, fight to uh, secure their tenure, um, which means they have legal access um, to manage it, harvest from it, but largely to protect it. And so as most things, uh, we've done it well on land first, and then the ocean tries to catch up. And so we are currently, I'm collaborating with a team globally that's um, been funded to develop a, a marine tenure facility, which will be essentially the mirror of this, uh, but for ocean communities. So that's a potential exciting way that communities will be able to help um, fight against injustices by having their marine tenure recognized. Um, so that is, is one example. So the final um, just type of resistance, which I think is the hardest to observe, but is probably the most common, is something called an everyday practice. And this language comes from James Scott, who wrote this book called Weapons of the Weak, Everyday Forms of Resistance in the 1990s. And he argues that if you are very marginalized, you may not have the ability to go out and protest. You may be fired, you may be physically harmed, you may be caught killed. And so there's other sort of more covert and subtle ways that communities have constantly pushed back against this kind of stuff. And one of the ways that we see this playing out in exciting ways is um, in, through food systems. And so this is an example of what we call a community-supported fisheries. So many coastal communities are saying, hey, when we sell our fish to these big corporations, we often go through middlemen, we often get a tiny fraction of the profit, maybe 5% of the total value of what they're actually catching. So they're saying, let's cut those guys out and instead work with people like us who want to support equitable and sustainable products. And so it's kind of like a prepay system where if you sign into one of these community supporting fisheries, you pay in advance for maybe six months of fish. It guarantees that the money goes to the coastal communities and then you get what they are catching. So Skipper Auto is one in Canada that is very vibrant and they deliver to St. Catharines, um, but there are these kinds of community supported uh, fisheries popping up all over the world. And just an example that is, you know, even more probably invisible, um, there's all kinds of work going on by coastal communities, often women, often indigenous and other uh, marginalized um, groups of women who have their rights stripped away. They have all these injustices, but they persist, and they persist through continuing to grow traditional and medicinal foods, continuing to provide for their families, continuing to care for their environments, uh, and so those are everyday practices of resistance as well that are being recognized um, by, by scholars as very important. So I would just like to end with a quick look at some frameworks or some um, entry points for supporting uh, blue justice and these kinds of resistance movements. So this is a paper that um, I collaborated on a couple of years ago where we recognized 10 types of blue injustices that are largely being driven by this blue economy, expand the, the economy through ocean development. Um, we recognize that while there are these 10 types of injustices, the inverse all often gives us entry points of ways that we can engage with, um, you know, supporting justice. And so those are things like securing tenure access, securing local food, um, food security, those types of things. <laughs> 
also to say this is not very beautiful, but there's so much known from the environmental justice movement, from the climate movement, from all kinds of important, you know, grassroots movements. There are very easy and tangible ways for us to engage in supporting um, justice. And so this is a bit jargony, but generally justice scholars agree that there are three types. Well, they disagree. They think there's five, they think there's three, that's what academics love to do. But these are three very uh, much agreed upon. So recognitional justice, in my mind, comes before you do anything. And it's really about recognizing who had right to that land in the first place, who should be involved in this decision making. And so we can take very like actionable steps to ensure recognition of justice. Things like identifying and differentiating rights holders and stakeholders before a project begins, acknowledging pre-existing rights, etc. Procedural justice is sort of while things are ongoing, and it's really about who is allowed to participate in discussions and decision-making processes. So we can try to do things like ensure that processes are inclusive, transparent, accountable, uh, that people who are on the front line are involved in decision-making processes, uh, ensure stakeholders have access to justice and conflict resolution mechanisms. Like These things are well known, they're just not well implemented yet. And finally, distributional justice is usually the most well known. It's essentially about uneven costs and benefits. So to me, that's kind of like the outcome. So uh, the after projects are being um, implemented. So we can take actions such as consider equity in the distribution of costs and benefits, design fair compensation mechanisms. You know, if there's going to be a case where we know a particular uh, group is going to bear the cost, um, compensation mechanisms, those types of things. So there are lots of ways that we can engage um, in supporting these, these coastal communities. And this is just a plug for a new project which is coming out. This is from a website which is about to go live. It's called the Ocean Defenders Project. And so again, ocean scholars fall behind. There's a land defenders movement, which is very well recognized. It's supported by the UN, a lot of resources, but we forgot that there's all kinds of coastal communities that are also defending their space. And so for the last year or so, I've been collaborating on this project, which is about raising the profile and then ensuring that resources go to these communities that are in front of So I would say watch this space. I will all harass you when it goes live, and uh, maybe I can give a talk next year about what's happening in this space. So in conclusion, there's a lot of work for us to do in this space as academics. We argue that academics can support communities in pursuing blue justice by co-producing inclusive science that describes what are the root causes of why this is happening the way it is, and then supporting them in co-created solutions. We also argue that everybody has a role in this space, so governments and NGOs can support blue justice efforts through changes in funding systems, through the devolution of power, or more participatory and procedurally just decision-making processes, and helping to secure local rights. Local tenure rights are a really key sort of lever that we um, have to ensure this. And so just to sort of come full circle and to bring this back, I'd like to finish with just like a one minute video by Dr. Bullard, who is the father of environmental justice. And he's saying, hey, we need communities to work with these, uh, sorry, we need universities to work with these communities in order to advance um, these issues of justice. And so let's just hear from him as the final word uh, today. It's really important that communities have researchers and scientists that they can call upon to assist and support. And so over the years, we have these community university partnerships, and that's what I've been part of and have been pushing for the last four decades. Environmental racism kills. It makes people sick. The environmental justice movement grew out of the fight for civil rights and human rights. When we bring them all together, it's just one movement, the movement for justice. My name is Dr. Robert Bullard. I'm a distinguished professor of urban planning and environmental policy at Texas Southern University. My job is to... Okay, I'm going to cut him off. I'm so sorry, Dr. Bullard. <laughs> um, but to me, that's really exciting because he's saying, do what we try to do here. We try to be transdisciplinary. We try to work with communities. We try to support what they do. We don't say we have the answers, let us give them to you, but rather we say let's work together to sort of understand and then co-create um, uh, solutions for these types of uh, issues that we all care about. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to take questions or turn it back to my own. Thank you.